Okay, it looks like we are ready to begin this evening. Um, so, uh, from what I can tell, it looks like there's uh, two folks on Zoom. So, Carol Odie, welcome, and Jeff Clark. It, Jeff Clark will be serving as our timekeeper this evening. Yep. <laughs> <coughs> Maybe you could work on being a time filler because we're going to be uh, challenged with this agenda this evening, I think. So just quickly, um, for those of us who are... We could end early. What's that? We could end there early. Oh, yes. I'm sure that would be appreciated also, yes. <laughs> so as always, we're uh, going to make an effort to listen to each other while we are speaking and we're going to respect the agenda and the process uh, we want folks to share their opinion but to do do so respectfully and uh, treat each other well those are our overriding goals so uh, <clears throat> so I guess what we'll do very quickly is uh, um, I think we do have an opportunity to for the folks on Zoom to introduce themselves. Uh, so, Carol? Hey, hi, I'm Carol Odie, and I live in Ward 4, and I represent um, Chittenden 6-1, which is the far north end of Burlington. I do that along with Bob Hooper, who is probably, uh, he told me he'd be on this call, he's not feeling well, but I want to make sure he gets on. All right, thank you. Can Jeff. I ask, can I ask Carol a question? Yeah. Um, let me wrap up introductions okay, first. Yes. Uh, Carol, so um, Sarah Carpenter has a question for you that we will come back to. Jeff? Jeff Clark, Ward 4 in the Senate Committee. I'll pass it on to Erhard. Well, Kristen's not Sarah Monica. I'm currently running for the Chicken Central Senate District. I live over in Ward 1. Just wanted to take a couple moments when you get to the public forum um, to, to introduce myself first. Okay, we will give you that opportunity. And Martha, you're up next. Oh. Oh. You're, you're muted, Martha. Oh, thank you. Martha Mulpitz, 47. Thank you. Judy, you're up. <clears throat> Recording in progress. Uh, I'm here. I just want to hear what's going on. Thank you. Okay. Steve. Stephen Hamlin, Ward 7. Thank you. And Bob. Mr. Hooper. Stores open. Looking for buttons. Uh, Bob Hooper. A little bit of a stomach problem. Sorry to not be there. Um, representative from this end of town with Carol for the uh, state rep. All right. Well, take care of yourself. Taking and care of you by staying here. <laughs> you're caring for us too, I suspect. Yeah, um, appreciate Lee? It. Hey there, Lee Morrigan. Um, just uh, attending to get caught up on the goings on. Okay, thank you. Um, so around the around the room um, here, Nancy, you want to pass the microphone? Nancy Comstock, Board Seven. Sarah Carpenter, um, Ward 4 City Council. Alec Cady, Parks and Rec. Oh, okay, good. All right, well, thank you, Alec. We'll uh, get back to you later this evening. Yes, thank, thanks for being here. Okay, so with that, um, I would, oh, uh, before, as we circle back to community announcements, um, Sarah, you said you had a question for Carol. 
Um, it's just a quick question. With the oops, okay. time, there you with go. the redistricting, our our district numbers have changed. Is that accurate? And is that in effect now? You're you're muted. What number? Can you just say that again, Sarah? Uh, you're no longer going to be six one. You're going to be some okay. other district. When does that change happen? Well, we are still in office until the new legislature is put into is sworn in in Jan the very beginning of January. However, the new uh, the new districts when when everybody votes, then you'll be voting. We have the same. Um, the same district configuration, but our our district will be called Chittenden 18. And that will be Bob. Bob and I are in what's now Chitten, what, what will be Chittenden 18. So when you're voting, it'll say Chittenden 18. Okay, that's just, well, I just want to clarify that. And there were no street changes at all in the, the redistricting? No, no Bob. Bob, you were on that committee. I don't think there was any change. Not in something? our, not in our district. No. Not in ours. Okay. Thank you. So it sounds like our geography stays the same. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Carol. Um, Bernhardt, you wanted to make an announcement on your own behalf. Yes, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so again, my name's Erhard Monka. Uh, nice to see some familiar faces uh, from out in the new North End. Um, I am, as I mentioned earlier, uh, running in the new Chittenden Central uh, District um, for the state Senate. Um, I have been um, a Chittenden County resident, Burlington resident for over 40 years with um, my wife, Sydney. We raised two adult children here. They went through the Burlington school system, K through, uh, K through 12. Um, I have, um, I was uh, back in the eighties when Bernie Sanders was mayor, I was on the city council. I served as city council president for a year uh, and was you know, part of the group of community leaders that uh, I, I would say, you know, helped uh, to make Burlington um, some of what it is today is, you know, a livable and, and inclusive city. Um, and I currently uh, I'm on leave from uh, working for Senator Sanders uh, in uh, his Senate office. Uh, I spent over uh, 20 years working for the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, uh, also worked as uh, the city's legislative liaison for 11 years over at the State House, um, and also worked for the city of Winooski. So I've uh, a lot of experience in housing, uh, as uh, Sarah knows well, and I think Carol and, and Bob uh, as well, uh, spent many years uh, advocating both for housing and, and for the city of Burlington uh, and the Burlington School District uh, at the uh, at the State House. Um, and if elected, I hope to work on, uh, guess what? Affordable housing, which is a huge crisis for us uh, statewide. Um, and uh, I see my time's up. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks for uh, the couple of minutes on your time, on your uh, agenda. Thank you. <clears throat> yep, and while we're uh, briefly talking about elections, I remind everybody that <clears throat> the primary um, is August 9th, and apparently uh, election season is open, so you, uh, you can request absentee ballots if you uh, wish to do so at this point in time. So, oh, can I interrupt? Yes. Uh, I wanted to thank Jeff for pointing out an error in the Front Porch Forum or the Facebook thing that I put out, which had inadvertently drawn the general election into the need to apply for a ballot thing, too. Just to be clear, everybody will get one. Uh, the primary is must request. Good. Yeah, that's a, that's an important because a uh, distinction, because I think people were kind of getting used to the uh, other approach. So it's important to to know the distinction for primary elections. Uh, all, right. all right, so with that, we will move on to the elected officials segment of the meeting. And so far, uh, Sarah Carpenter, it looks like you're our primary guest this evening. So if okay. you could come on up and join me at the table and...
Thank you. This, it's going to take some uh, getting used to this new setup, and I'm not sure who I'm look. Who am I looking at here? But hopefully, somebody has me on camera. Um, been a busy month. This is really the prime um, budget season. In addition to our regular council meetings and committee meetings, we had four, actually five um, budget meetings. So that's sort of been occupying most of the time. Um, I don't think we'll find any surprises. Uh, we're quite tightening our belt. Um, and I, I can try to answer questions best I can. In the midst of that, we happen to have all of the major uh, unions renegotiating their contracts. So it's been a, it's a difficult um, time where I think it's going well, but it's difficult. Um, I personally have been working on, um, still working on the short-term rental potential ordinance was postponed from an earlier meeting in June, and we're intending to, um, I hope, vote on the compromise we have on our meeting on the 27th. The 27th meeting will be, will be long, a long meeting. Um, as I said, we have the budget as a major part of that and, and a number of, of other things. One of the things I've been doing this month is serving as chair of the committee that makes the recommendations on all the boards and commissions. It's, it's a five-person committee. Councilor Jang is on it as well. Um, Councilor McGee, Councilor Bergman, and Jordan Rendell from the mayor's office. And we had lots of talented people apply and not always spots for everybody, but thank you. Any and all of people who applied, um, we'll be uh, voting on that at our meeting on the 27th as well. Um, I'm this year serving on the charter change committee and a couple things we've got on the docket there. We are, um, there's an intent to bring forward um, a resolution for a charter change to allow legal um, resident non-citizen voters. If you recall, there had been a resolution around that. Really, I think it was the January of 2020 and it, it just got sidelined. Um, with COVID. It has passed in two communities, Montpelier and Winooski, and I very much suspect the language that we're going to recommend will be very similar to what has been approved legislatively as well as by the voters in those communities. Um, we'll also be considering um, language that would allow us to uh, have the redistricting process um, be other in our charter so that the next time we do this, we would not have to take it to the legislature. You're probably going to ask me, well, so what's happening with redistricting? And I'm not sure as of tonight that I can tell you that. Um, it's some of you have been following it as much as I have, and it's clear there is not yet a consensus on what configuration um, we ought to have. Uh, it's I can't give you my best guess on that one, really, honestly, at the moment. Um, there's lots and lots of conversations about it, but we are not yet on the same page around that. Um, a more minor thing that we may take up is just um, allowing the option of combining polling places. Uh, it wouldn't be a requirement, but there's a sense that in some wards and going into the future with redistricting, that might make a prudent sense to allow that as an option. I also serve on the Community Development Revitalization, Neighborhood Revitalization Committee. Um, that's the committee at the minute um, that has been considering a proposed ordinance about camping for houseless folks. We have been waiting for a couple of months for a legal review and we've not yet received it, in part because we are now missing both our former city attorney, uh, Dan Richardson, who's left, and just as of a few weeks ago, the deputy uh, city attorney, Justin St. James, is also leaving, so the city is Oy. very short <laughs> on legal 
uh, legal assistance in in a good vein and and maybe a future um, topic for us is the CEDO. If you if you recall, about six or eight weeks ago, we there was a plan. Part of the plan in, included the temporary shelter on Elmwood Avenue, but it also included staffing capacity for both the CEDO office and for um, CVOEO around services for the houseless. And CEDO's hired a woman by the name of Sarah Russell, who comes with a lot of strong background. I think that'll be a big help to us. She's already been um, working on interdepartmental meetings on some of the policies. So I, I might suggest that would be a, maybe a topic for us in a, in a future meeting. Um, I did not have a chance to tech in with Brian Pine at CEDO about the process on the, or uh, the progress on the pods. It, it, it appears it's past planning, past planning commission, but I, I don't have a recent update on that. I'm trying to think, I think that's been it for the last month since I last checked in with you. So I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Are there any questions here in the room? Okay. I have a question on TV. Okay, I'm going to start here in the room, and we'll get back to you, Bob. I have a question um, regarding dis redistricting. Mm -hmm. um, first, I want to thank Jeff and Robert and yourself for all the work that you've <laughs> done on it so far. Um, but my question is, at, at what point is the spinning of the wheels just called gerrymandering? Because it feels like there's an awful lot of people trying to fine tune it for their benefit. Um, and according I mean, I'm, to what- I'm not sure I call it, gerrymandering is when you end up with something for a really, um, it's a term that's used, you know, probably not a great purpose. I think the problem is where we've had growth in the city is makes it uneven for the traditional neighborhoods. Out here, even though Ward 4 has grown, Ward 7 has not. And so for us to, for, for example, um, maintain a district or two wards for Ward 7 and equal the percentage across the city, um, it, it pushes in several map configurations to um, creep south into the old North End. So that has a number of people concerned. Uh, conversely, the, the Ward 8, which really turned into a significantly student ward, and I think everyone was committed to reconfiguring that. The bottom line is we still have two big census blocks with a ton of students in them. And, and where you parse that out, I mean, we can't just blow it up and make it go away. You know, you put it in Ward 6, you put it in Ward 1, you put it in Ward 3. And so that's, I think, those are probably the two things that we're struggling with in the context of people are not very happy with the district system and people are not happy about the thought of having 16 counselors. So, you know, you throw it up and that's really what we're trying to balance. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have uh, two, two questions online. Uh, we will start with uh, Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you. Um, Sarah, I've only heard about a 12 division uh, redistricting. So can you give me an idea of what else is uh, in the horse race on the table out in front? And secondly, I only know of three city attorneys so if two of them have quit, how many more? Is Haley the only one that's left? And she's... Uh, we hired a new... Um, I think there's three. Haley, um, now I'm blanking. There were, there, were two, there were two new hires in the last two years. Um, Tim Devlin is the other one, and Jared Pellerin. Um, so there's those three attorneys at the moment. Um, the, not much has changed. The original uh, instruction was seven wards, eight wards, and 12 wards. And as far as I'm concerned, those are all on the table. P different people have expressed 
different opinions about their preference for those or not. So um, I, I don't think any of them is out of the running at all. It's simply trying to get the concurrence of a majority of the council. And you didn't mention the IRV, RCV uh, conversation about it went directly yes. to. Yes, um, there was a proposal um, to, as you all recall, I think it was in 21, um, the majority of the citizens voted to allow ranked choice voting in councilor elections. It finally passed the legislature this last session and um, gave the city with um, some modifications in the language, the option of looking at the methodology for ranked choice voting. Uh, there was a proposal to um, waive all the reading and enact that immediately. Um, rather than send it to the ordinance committee and review other options um, of ranked choice voting methodologies. That did not pass. So uh, Councillor Barlow and I did not support that. I did feel it should go to a committee. I'm not sure, to be honest, that would change the outcome. Um, but I thought since this really, in fact, um, won't immediately affect us, there was time to have it go to a committee. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I need, I want to quickly move on to uh, Earnhardt. Hi, uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, hey, Sarah, um, you mentioned uh, the short-term rental ordinance, and I, uh, as you know, I worked on that some, but haven't been able to pay close attention. Just wondering if you could give a quick update on what the compromise looks like, and then I'll also apologize in advance for having to leave the meeting early. I've got another uh, one coming right up. Actually, it's 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 been what's on, been on the table for a number of months now. As you remember, there was a proposal early in the year that would have significantly just shut out short-term rentals. I actually proposed an amendment that would allow um, owner occupants to short-term rent a portion of their own home or short-term rent a unit on their property, either attached or on the same property lot. Um, so that's still in there, as well as a proposal that would allow an owner of a two unit or more building to uh, offer one short-term rental in return for one affordable rent, uh, affordable rental set at the inclusionary rent. So those are basically all still in there. There's somewhat more detail on it, but that, that's basically all in there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, it, it's, oh, uh, Lee? Yes, hey, um, well, first of all, Sarah, I wanna do, Thank you for your uh, advocacy, I think it was last week, about um, the uh, transphobic stickers that had showed up. Yes. Um, again, I know, um, I heard that you you may have had some conversations with people after that, or just basically wondering if you have any updates about your interactions with any city officials. I don't, I honestly, I wish I did. Um, it's very frustrating and very disturbing, um, but uh, we're being told to date, there's not a lot of way to enforce it. It's not considered hate speech under state law. Uh, I'm told that it's not considered vandalism unless we catch them in the act. Um, I, I had proposed, and I think we need to follow through on what else can we do? And I, I'm a little bit stymied. It's certainly a conversation that we can maybe have tonight when we talk about public safety, because it's certainly a public safety issue. Um, you know, is there something more as a community that we could do, um, that we could do? And I, I wish I had an answer for you, but we, we should not let the conversation drop. Okay, and let's see. I thought I saw one other, oh, Emma. Could... Yeah, Jeff, I was just gonna add to the trans the transphobic <laughs> stickers. Yeah, just to, just to the transphobic stickers piece, because uh, Sarah, you and I should probably just connect offline. There was um, 
a member from, I don't know what, four or seven, somewhere in, in my legislative district. And we've been connecting with some folks on this side of the old North End who are also concerned with the stickers showing up on the bike paths and Letty Park and other places. Um, so there is an effort that folks are, are going to start a crowdsourcing campaign to fund positive trans inclusive stickers and community-based stickers, um, which I can share more about that. And I, I just hadn't known that you were in the loop on that. So I'm happy to follow up soon with folks about that. It, there's some organizing happening right now to make sure that that hate speech isn't um, le left up there. It's very hard to take those stickers down. So there's some folks organizing around that. Thank you. Um, Sylvia, for, I'm gonna squeeze in one more quick question for Sylvia. Um, sorry, I... It's working. It's on. I'm a little bit in the dark. What kind of what stickers are we talking about? Are they hate stickers? They're anti-trans stickers that are posing and offensive and ugly um, about trans persons. There's a um, a small group of young young people that go around and try to dismantle such. I, I will say the city staff name, and... their their name is uh, the the Burlington Cleanup Crew. They have focused on uh, racist um, uh, stickers uh, posters before. I don't know if they could branch out into this this uh, area. Well, I I like Emma's and I, and uh, I know I know one of the guys. Positive thing. I mean, I will say, city staff, when yeah. when it's reported, they've been very prompt in removing them. So it's just that it keeps it's persistent. It's continuing to be persistent, and that's the frustration yeah. around it. It's uh, I, I, we've encouraged everyone to report it both both on C clicks C click fix and to the Burlington Police Department. Thank you. Okay, so oh, Nancy, quickly. So, are is Emma proposing that new stickers get put over the stickers that are already? Well, I have uh, this is new to me, so I think um, we hadn't coordinated yet. To understand so, yeah. what? Yeah, because I, I would hope that's not the answer. No, I, I mean I think there are other ways. To, I would hope there's other ways to be positive, and so right. we should look at yeah. that. Okay. And, and then uh, I have another question. If if, gotta if it's make it my quick. turn, we got to move on. Oh, um, so I know Mark Barlow dialed in tonight and said he couldn't make it, but our city councilor seems to be missing for the last two or three, with no explanation or apology or uh, what's going on. Is is he still living here? Or <laughs> he's an active uh, councilor, so I think. You know, I don't know what his schedule is, he just but he doesn't, certainly is participating on the council level. He just doesn't dig this or something. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. And we've discovered that some of us, we think, are blocked on his Facebook page, so that doesn't help the conversation either. Okay. So I guess thank you very much, Sarah. Hey, thank you. Um, Always. Yeah. Thank you. And just, you know, I this is just to say to the next speaker, it's very odd. I really don't know who I'm looking at. So if I'm looking weirdly, it's because I don't know who the audience is. Right. Well, but. we, we, uh, Charlie and Sam devised kind of a hybrid system okay. because well, that's okay. last, last month we had a real hard time with yeah. uh, uh, Peter Irish yeah. getting, being able yeah. to hear. So, yeah. yeah, I, I think the the setups to address that, and I, I think it, it's a good one. Thank you. Yep. Seems to be working so far. Okay, so we'll we'll move on. Uh, we'll we'll do our legislative uh, reps, and I I guess we'll go back to the beginning. And so you each have five minutes, and then we have uh, yeah another uh, yeah five minutes for questions at the end. Okay, so. Uh, Jeff Clark will be our diligent timekeeper and Carol Odie, I'm going to let you lead off. Thank you. You're muted. There you go. There. Okay. So um, I thought I would talk a little bit about housing and what's happening with that. So um, in the second half of our biennium, the legislature allocated $1.3 billion for housing. And broken down, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. One point one hundred forty-five million dollars toward housing, and broken down that was one hundred five million dollars for mixed income housing development, twenty-five million dollars for the Vermont Home Improvement Program, and fifteen million dollars for missing middle housing 
pilot program. And that continued the, con the commitment that was begun the in the first half of the biennium to invest in affordable housing. So also, I think um, the legislature really had to face that there's a very severe housing crisis. Before the pandemic, the median purchase price of homes in Vermont rose by two to 3% a year. But in 2020 to 2021, that it jumped to 10% a year. So that was a, it's a very uh, constrictive market and it's squeezing low and middle income Vermonters out of home ownership. Um, and some many pandemic supports and protections are dissolving and that a, creates a, a further impact on what people can afford to live in. So um, the Vermont Housing Conservation Board received a $10 million increase to its base funding from the property transfer tax, bringing that funding to almost two thirds of the statutory funding. This is something that the Vermont Housing Conservation Board is going to fight for full funding of the statutory requirement. And I will be joining them. In um, and in, as a matter of fact, um, the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition will be every month bringing together legislators and candidates um, and constituents through virtual regional town halls to talk about housing. And I would encourage all of you who are listening to contact the VAHC and get involved, come to those meetings so that you can hear what's happening and advocate for full statutory allocation for housing every year. That's from the property transfer tax and it had been, um, not fully funded for years and years and years. And that would have alleviated a lot of our housing problems had we had that fully funded. So that is important for today and going forward. So um, the governor did veto our charter change on just cause eviction, but for rental housing safety in the state of Vermont, um, the Department of Public Safety is going to create five inspector positions to implement a complaint driven rental housing inspection program and for the Vermont Rental Housing Improvement Program, which rehabs non-code compliant units and allows new accessory dwelling units. Um, there's $20 million allocated for major renovation of blighted and substandard housing and 20% of the funding must be used for the creation of accessory dwelling units. That's it's a law apartment, which you might think of it, or a, 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 a unit on land where there's already a dwelling where it, it can be used for housing. So, um, some things, just a couple of things, because I'm just right out of time. But um, there, there is a first generation home buyers program that Tell her. Will help families who are also first generation home buyers. And that's an allocation of $1 million for a revolving loan fund. That should be helpful in Burlington. It'll be transferred to the VHFA for the administration of the program and for outreach. There's a missing middle program, which should help Burlingtonians. It's a total allocation of 15 minutes, $15 million of the ARPA funds with $5 million from 2022 and 10 million in 2023. And this will subsidize the construction of modest new home or the acquisition and substantial re, uh, rehab of an existing home. Um, there will also may be a, there will be a further subsidy that may be paid to bring down the cost to the level of affordability for people. I see one minute, okay. And um, there's also an unfair housing practices that addresses harassment and discrimination in housing section. And then um, there's a temporary moratorium on the sale of a home where the owner is delinquent in property tax payments, water and sewer charges, and so forth. Um, that expires in 2025, but that allows people to keep their homes um, for this tough time. And uh, finally, the last thing, um, Act 250, which you hear about a lot, um, because of climate change, the logging roads, which used to be frozen for a good part of the year, are thawing, so it's um, there's a change in Act 250 now that will allow district commissions to allow for 
trucking of wood products to happen in expanded hours in the forests so that they can get their wood products in and out um, on those roads before they thaw. That's it. Good. Thank, thank you, Carol. All right, and we'll come back to questions later. So uh, we'll flip a coin and uh, Emma, are you prepared to go next? I am, and I would appreciate that because I'm solo parenting. So if you hear children interrupt me, they're just not off, off screen here. So hopefully they'll, anyway, they're cute. they will be a fun little advertisement. So I just wanted to start, as folks know, the, uh, this, the legislature wrapped up in the uh, first half of May. So it's always kind of interesting to come to the MPAs in the off session and pick out what to talk to you all about and sort of try to read your minds a little bit. So I thought I would first give you two um, updates on a policy event I'm, I'm hosting in July, and then also a bit about uh, the Green Mountain Care Board and its, its health care rates that it's speaking to. I did a bigger update um, on Front Porch Forum and in the Facebook New North End um, uh, group that included a lot more details because I know I can't drop links in, but I wanted to first start with those two pieces then talk a little bit about climate. So the first piece I want to share, we, sp we spoke a little bit last um, month, Bob Hooker brought this up, um, around just starting to have more of a proactive conversation around gun policy in this state. Um, then as a mom of two young kids, this is front of mind for me every day. And I'm, I, I'm going to be hosting an event. It will be all on Zoom. So it'll be fully virtual on July 21st uh, from 7.30 to about 8.30. I'll be joined by members of Gun Sense Vermont and Moms Demand Action, the Vermont chapter, as well as maybe a, um, another guest or two to just round out a discussion, understanding where Vermont's gun policy is and how can we make some more common sense and responsible policy to really be addressing here in the state um, the whole myriad of issues that um, our current policy presents to us around community safety, uh, mental health, and other issues that arise with, with um, fairly easy gun access. So all are invited. Um, there's a registration link for it just to keep the Zoom space a little safe. But if you would like to reach out to me, I would have dropped it in the chat, but again, it's in the uh, Front Porch Forum posting, it, the link to sign up as well as on, um, on the, the Facebook group. And I'm happy to, I'll, I'll send it out a few more times so people know how to participate if you'd like. Uh, the second piece I want to let folks know is the Vermont Healthcare Advocate, which is an extension of Vermont Legal Aid, which advocates to really help Vermonters navigate the complexities of the health insurance world we all swim in in this state, in the country. Um, it also does some, a bit of advocacy and wants to make sure Vermonters know that the Green Mountain Care Board, which regulates um, uh, the hospitals as well as has some oversight on the insurance companies, they're having a rate review hearing in July. I actually don't have the date in front of me, but they're having a rate review meeting in July, and this is an open public comment period. And this is important because Blue Cross is proposing a 12.3%, 12.3% increase for the next plan year. And then MVP is proposing a 17.4% increase. So if you'd like to provide public comment, it's through the Healthcare Advocate site. You can, they can even help put your thoughts together if you, if you need some help putting your, your thoughts around how this impacts you or your neighbors on this extreme, you know, yet again, another extreme rate increase on insurance, uh, which I think is completely unaffordable and we need we need to do more there. I saw I only had less than two minutes. So I'm just briefly gonna just build off of the climate piece here. Um, I want folks to know that even while the governor vetoed two important um, climate and environmental bills, I want people to know about them. So the clean heat standards bill, H715, was something that we got very close to overriding the veto on, but um, it was really the only major piece of legislation to advance Vermont forward in our pollution reduction commitments that we had under the climate action plan. And it would have really started to move, take some significant steps about reducing carbon pollution from um, fossil fuel based heating systems and sources and with helping Vermonters transition to things that are based off of more renewable heat sources. So I hope we bring that back next session. If I return next session, I'll certainly be supportive of continuing to push that direction. The other brief thing, I'm trying not to speed up talking here, is just to build off of the Act 250, we tried to also do some more modernization and reforms to Act 250 um, to both help with the oversight, to make sure that we have good policy making oversight rather than the sort of broken system we have now um, that would help with moving projects forward as well as um, giving communities that have good jurisdiction um, with local ordinances or, or zoning um, as well as with uh, that have designated downtowns and neighborhood divisions to be able to step over the Act 250 process so there's not duplication and the whole bill got vetoed. So I just note that because if we're trying to really solve for housing and place smart place basement for you know smart development for housing, this is just a, a, a very problematic approach for trying to address both environmental our environmental issues as well as our housing issues. 
and I'm not, and I'm going to pause there because I don't want to go over my time, but I'm happy to talk about any other topics. And in the future, both the MPA steering committee, if you want us to like focus on particular topics in this weird off session time, just say the word, because I want to come and talk about what you want to hear and not simply guess what I think you might want to hear about in the month of June or July or, or whenever. So thanks so much. Thank you, Emma. <clears throat> Robert. I muted myself. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, the good thing about going third is a lot of the high points have already been hit. Um, as Carol mentioned, and Emma, uh, housing was a big issue this year. Um, and I tried to make the distinction that there's a lot of difference between what people talk about, which is affordable housing and housing that is in affordable. It's not the same thing. One's a math problem. The other's a, a real, how things are constructed and what's available. Um, Carol mentioned, I think that there's a direction toward mid market housing, uh, because it seems like either you're getting a raft of, uh, small 600 square foot apartments, or you're getting, uh, huge things that are well above what anybody would consider affordable. Uh, I think we need to hone a little bit more in on that particular part of the market, and it seems like we're doing so. Um, another big problem that we have had, demographics, uh, we addressed some, some child care issues. Uh, not enough, I don't think, at this point. Um, that's something that I think is going to continue to be a problem if we want Vermont to be sustainable in terms of a mixing of the generations. Uh, at this point, one of the things that weighs heavily upon our investment funds in both retirement funds and the city also is the fact that we have uh, such a high proportion of people who are elderly um, looking to take money out of systems than youthful looking to put money in. Um, we did a little bit of work to protect bugs this year. Um, we did, those of us um, from this end of town, put a lot of uh, time and effort and conversation into the pupil funding ratio. Uh, we didn't find, I don't think, any great gold mine for high school construction or anything like that, but um, we did at least get some movement on how much money is going to be coming in to the district itself. Um, speaking of district, if you're as confused as I am by where the Senate districts are now, uh, blame your senators. They're the ones that created it. Um, it's it's a, an interesting looking map. Um, and lastly, I'll pick up on uh, what Emma started to say. Um, I mentioned that last NPA meeting and I sent out a uh, front porch forum questionnaire basically about the gun issue. I think it's going to be very significant in our conversation next year. Uh, I think that it's going to be uh, difficult because there are a lot of people who think that the second amendment can be wiped away. Uh, and that's not the case. It would be very problematic. The language could, I think, be clarified a lot more so that uh, the ability to own a gun does not mean the ability to own any gun. And there are some that are appropriate and some that just are flatly not. Uh, so I wanted to get a sense from you all, and I'm surprised at the amount of feedback I've gotten um, of just where you think this should be going. So if you didn't, you still can, um, state rep Hooper at Gmail. And I really would appreciate hearing because I suspect there's going to be a pretty radical bill come out of judicial and it would be better if it were not the same thing as what the Senate just passed on a federal level which does absolutely nothing to address the problem, but is a great opportunity all of a sudden for everybody to be patting themselves on the back for doing something. Um, I don't think, I don't think until fundamentally we changed the meaning of the word gun, um, are we going to impact the number of children that get killed 
for no reason whatsoever. All right. Thank you, Bob. So we have, uh, we're going to go into our question and answer opportunity and <clears throat> so that everyone on Zoom knows that <clears throat> we got a notice from the school board folks that they are not attending this evening because they're at another board meeting. So uh, we'll start with our allocated five minutes. And if there's, if the conversation is lively, then we can add another five minutes to this question and answer session if necessary. So I will begin here in the room at Miller Center. Okay. We have a couple of questions here. Go, go ahead. Thank you. And I, I do want to thank the legislators for all the work you did on housing. It's it's fabulous, but <laughs> we got to build it. We got to find sites to build it, and that's a year to two years away. We have a significant um, immediate problem with the houses in Burlington, and it lands literally in Burlington's lap. The um, potential of stopping the motel program is very concerning to me and, and is concerning to the city. We, we need some really good short-term uh, steps to take. The right answer is build more housing, but I don't see that happening till next summer just because that's what it takes. So that's my two cents, and I, I actually know you all support that, but I'm trying to say it publicly because I think it's very important. And just and uh, maybe Chief Mira can update us, but to know one of the public safety measures that the city has put money in its budget for is a crisis intervention model called so, so called cahoots model, but um, there's an RFP, it's gone out, come back, and like a lot of things, is, is way over the price tag that we had anticipated. The city's turning to the state for support, and I'm saying again this sort of editorial because I think I have your support, but it's going to be that's a critical thing for public safety, and it's a critical thing for serving many of our houseless residents. Somebody in the back there. Hello, I would like to ask Carol Odie a question. You came up with a number of 10% that is the value has gone up on housing. Where did you get that number from? I got that from a report from the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Okay. I, I's, uh, as a realtor, I think that number very sadly is very low. Um, it's much higher than that. Um, I wish I could tell you you were too high, but I think it's different. It's gone way up. Um, and, and I can check with uh, VAR, get that number, and get to you and let you know. Um, I mean, I, I realize you're just giving us what you have, but unfortunately, it is a low number. I mean, I know from our MLS stats in Chittenden County, it's very low. So um, we have a real problem with housing, and I think we all know that. And now that we have higher interest rates, um, which will go up again this year, that might help a bit. I don't know. But um, as a realtor who came in the business at 15.5% interest, um, I know the prices stayed low because of that. So I, I, I don't have an answer, but I'd love to work on something like that with all of you. And thanks to all of you for reporting tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you, Carol. I, I, um, I appreciate that information, and I would love to see it and, and um, communicate with the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition about that. All right. Are there? I see a couple of hands online, but are there any other questions here in the at the Miller Center? No. Oh, okay. So let's see. Uh, Jeff Clark, I think you were on in the queue. Yeah. Um, again, thanks for you all being here, our state reps, um, um, and for all your hard work. The um, the what you mentioned, Bob, is that we can't um, do anything on gun safety until next year. Is there any way to do something sooner than next year? And you're asked, you've asked for feedback, and, and feedback that I would have is that we should have what is described as common sense gun laws, and we should not have, um, you know, feedback I would have is we should not have um, machine guns on our streets in Vermont. 
Well, thanks, Steph. I don't think anybody is uh, going to argue with that. But as I say that, I know 100% that there are people who would argue with that. Um, I think the fundamental problem is that the Second Amendment is pretty vague. Um, if, if, you know, we were able to get a Supreme Court that would clarify um, limitations, and, and an example of that is uh, Congress in 19, I think it was 34, maybe it was 43. Um, you can still, you mentioned machine guns, but the general public cannot own a machine gun. But people can own machine guns if they go through a particular process. Um, even now, a lot of our state cops seem to go through the process when they retire. Um, so we could, if we were very good at crafting uh, restrictions around what exists, um, probably put more limitations on the number of weapons and the type of weapons that people could uh, deal with. Um, but it's it's a tough hill to climb, and it has to be done legislatively. I don't think the governor can issue an edict. The governor could issue an edict that said, head legislature, come on back in. I got a problem here. I need you to pass something. Uh, but it doesn't seem like that's something that he's really eager to do. Um, the, federal, the federal people try very hard to keep those things within their jurisdiction. So anytime a state does something, uh, it gets a lot of scrutiny. Uh, I think I think we should be able to have more control over what happens in our own localities. Uh, but that's asking somebody else to give up power. It's like a charter change. Sometimes it's hard to do. Thank you. Um, Trish, I noticed you had your hand up earlier. Oh, do you have you changed your mind or do you want an opportunity? Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, uh, Jeff Clark asked the question I was going to ask, and thank you, Representative Hooper, for answering it. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, <clears throat> we're going into extra innings here, so we're, we've got two questions that I see. So we'll go Emma first and then uh, followed by Evan. Thanks, Jeff. I just wanted to build a little bit off um, just to the other Jeff's point, uh, qu just comment about the gun piece. Um, I met with the reason why I'm actually having the event in July is that a few folks reached out after the Texas shooting who were um, parents in the old North End who send kids to the same child care center that I, my child goes to. And uh, when we were, I did a little bit of research and just looking at some of the probably in that category of common sense um, uh, policy that Vermont should really think about. It, it's it's larger than just mass shootings, sadly, because the access to guns also impacts mental health, people who are in crisis, who can get easy and quick access to guns. It contributes to a whole other elements of that we're struggling with in our community around the suicide rate, et cetera. And as I've been talking to more and more folks, again, why I'm going to hold this event, there's a lot of ways that this, this intersects. So I think thinking in, about waiting periods, thinking about really life-saving measures around the, the um the, the uh, sort of the supply chain of how people access guns in the state are all pieces that I think we should um, examine. And uh, and then while there might be other bigger, bolder um, pieces of legislation, I think there might be different parts of advancing policy changes that can really do this in a, in a smart way to really start to um, understand how guns are contributing to all the pieces, including the, you know, the um, increased gun violence in Burlington, we have to look at how this connects to that as well and how people get guns, how it's very unregulated, um, the lack of licenses, the lack of the fact that gun dealers in Vermont are required to hold a license. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that once you start getting into it is, to me, quite alarming. And, and I want to explore that more. So happy for folks to also reach out to me. And again, all are invited to that July event, which I'll post more about. Thanks, Jeff. Right. Thank you. So, Evan, you're up. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm always so grateful to have all of our legislative reps being able to attend this meeting. Um, it just makes me feel really close to the people who represent me in Montpelier. Um, and I just wanted to thank Emma uh, Mulvaney Stanek, who, who came to my neighborhood and my community um, and knocked on doors and talked to folks and really heard them, uh, many of whom are really struggling and um, had a lot to say about um, what 
uh, about need just in general. And so thank you, Emma, for coming and doing that. Um, housing came up. Uh, I brought up housing last month as well. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to rebring up while Representative Odie was here um, and give you the opportunity to respond back to me because you did email me the other day and thank you. Haven't had a chance to write you back. But um, I heard you talking about, you know, the squeeze on the lower and middle kind of working class folks that's happening right now. And you, you know, you hit the nail on the head. Um, it's hard for me to read to hear to read in VPR today that we're spending millions of more dollars to bring more workers um, to Vermont when they have nowhere to live. Um, and the people who are already here are also struggling every single day on Front Porch Forum and everywhere else, um, begging for an apartment to rent. Um, I just wanna re-ask the question, you know, will you, are you willing to take up next um, session revisiting and removing the changes to the renter rebate program that came into effect after five years during this really this economic crisis that we're having and 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 to add to that question i pulled up the income limits now and so for a two person household to even get a partial credit in Chittenden County, you you have to earn less than $38,000 a year. So I think those numbers are so egregious and to take those renter rebates away, in, particularly in a city where over 60% of people are renting um, from so many people is, is worrisome to me and I would like to see more people be able to re-access the money that they lost this year um, going forward. And so I wonder, are you willing, you know, to revisit that? Absolutely. I, I want to revisit that. And I also want to look at the $47,000 threshold that's, that's um, in the law. This is, um, It's very important to me that Chittenden County, where prices are even higher than the rest of the state, does not is not saddled with perhaps the same number applied in formulas as other places. So um, we certainly uh, came a long way with our school funding, and this is uh, something that I raised as an issue this past session and that I will continue to work on. And thank you for bringing it up and I look forward to uh, to working on it. I appreciate it. I would just add, I think looking at it for each county, it's problematic for every single county across Vermont. So if you wanna, if anybody's curious, you can just Google Vermont renter credit and click income you know, uh, limitations and you can really see that uh, we've really cut out those working lower, you know, the working poor and the, and the lower middle class folks who are renters and many of whom will now stay renters. Um, thanks to, you know, as some of the realtors were saying in the room, I really appreciated that comment, you know, 10% 10, 10 okay. or more. So thanks. I'm, yeah, I'm, a quick question. I'm quiet now, Jeff. <laughs> I have, um, a comment from Bob Hooper. Um, you said, and I probably won't say, quote this quite right, but there's a difference between affordable housing and housing that you can afford. Um, that just kind of really clicked with me. Um, affordable housing is just too vague for my head. And it seems like everybody I ask what exactly that means, I get a quadrillion different answers. But housing that you can afford, that puts it in a different perspective and I think has given me something to think about now. So I, I put it in the context of housing that is affordable. Um, and Sarah could probably elaborate right. on a lot more. But when somebody, when a construction person is saying, I'm going to build a building and 20% of the apartments are going to be affordable, it's a math equation that's based on the market rate for the stuff that he's building. Um, it's not based on 
the the that it ties in with what Ethan was just saying, the general uh, availability of money in the system in which you're you're working. So there should be a cap set on what affordable housing can cost. The same way in, in Chittenden County, anyway, under the AFDC program in days past, um, if you lived in Chittenden County, you got a I hate to say bonus because there wasn't anything bonus about it, but your payment for taking care of your children was higher than in the rest of the state. It recognized that in Chittenden County, particularly Burlington, um, it cost more to live here. I don't know if they still do that or not. I have not heard it uh, applied to any equation that uh, we put out in terms of distribution of funds uh, budget wise, but there there's, no question even is uh, even said there's you know you go around the state it's expensive everywhere but particularly in Chittenden County if you see where people are building housing they're building three bedroom nice houses they're not building uh stuff that the people who are hanging out on Sears Lane months ago are are looking to get into okay. Thank you. So um, I'm going to exercise a little discretion and we've, uh, I feel like we've gained about 10 minutes in our agenda. So uh, our next presenter is um, Mariah Flynn from the uh, Burlington Partnership for Healthy Community. And um, Mariah, I welcome to our NPA and I'm going to give you the floor. I apologize. That was a quick transition. I wasn't quite ready for that. So I'm ready now. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. I can share some slides with you all. Uh, there we go. Yep, we can see that. Thank you. Beautiful. Wonderful. Um, so thank you all for having uh, me in the Burlington Partnership. I am uh, Mariah Flynn. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Coalition Director for the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community. We are the Substance Misuse Prevention Coalition that serves Burlington. Um, we are a coalition of partners and organizations that are working together um, and individuals in the community that are working on strategies to reduce the causes and consequences of substance uh, misuse in Burlington. Um, there's a variety of strategies that we work on, but I'm here today just to share with you one specific uh, resource that we and tool that we've made for the Burlington community to use um, and for neighborhoods to think about how it's relevant for them. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what we do, uh, please reach out to me anytime that we can talk about the other work we're doing. Um, I thought it would be helpful, though, for us to just do a little framing first about why we've created this tool. So... Um, Sorry, I'm going to use two different screens, so I'm going to go back and forth so I can read some notes for you and stay on time. Um, so the circular graphic on the screen that you see is the Vermont prevention model. It's a socio-ecological model for prevention that Vermont uses. Um, and um, effective work in our state to be the most effective in terms of substance misuse prevention. We want work happening at every um, piece of that, each of those circles. Um, our coalition focuses um, on the uh, two outermost circles, the community level prevention and policies and systems, mostly at a community level. Um, that's where strategies have the greatest impact um, and have the most, um, if you're looking at the environment that people are living in and how that supports healthy choices. Um, but, there, but in order to make, um, like I said, uh, prevention effective. You want things happening at every level. So there are other organizations and folks probably know of some of them that are doing work at the individual level and building relationships and that um, an environment that supports folks that are doing work at that level really helps um, um, helps effective prevention happen. Um, so we focus, our coalition focuses heavily on strategies that prevent and delay use for adolescents for as long as possible. And the reason why this is so important is because we know that 90% of people who develop a substance use disorder 
um, started using before the age of 18. So addiction or substance use disorder really is an adolescent disease. Um, it's more, so the more that we can create environments that normalize non-use and support kids to remain substance free while their brains are still developing, um, we know that they have better outcomes um, and the community thrives. So just again, to give a little bit of framing for the rest of the conversation, there's a lot of data out there around to help us understand substance use issues in our community. Um, we're not gonna get into all of it, um, but just to give you a snapshot of some of the key data that's relevant to the conversation today. So you have a sense of where Burlington is. Um, this is a graph that shows the most commonly used substances by Burlington high school youth, which are alcohol, cannabis or marijuana and nicotine. Um, and, and I'm using the word marijuana because that's what the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the survey that asks this questions about this substance, that's the language that they use. So you'll see in this slide that alcohol use has been the most common substance of choice for youth in our community. It's, it's pretty much the same in our state. Um, it's also the most commonly used substance by adults in Vermont, um, and it's the most easily accessible. Um, but in recent years, cannabis use has also increased to match um, alcohol use rates. Um, and our, in 2015, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that all students in our state take in public schools um, also started tracking use of electronic vapor products. So that's why you see that line, the um, purple line start in 2015. Um, and that's, there's been a drastic increase in use of those substances between 2017 and 2019. And soon the Youth Risk Behavior Survey for 2021 that students took recently um, will be out hopefully this fall um, and we'll have a better sense of where things are. But anecdotally, we work a lot with the schools um, and we also do our own surveying um, of students and we're seeing again a in, uh, drastic increase in electronic vapor use products, both for cannabis and nicotine. So in thinking about that, um, one of the things I should also note is that Vermont has high, some of the highest substance use rates in the nation for youth um, for alcohol and cannabis. So um, our organization wants to do something about that, um, as I think many of our communities do. Um, and what we know can, can help prevent um, and delay use for kids is responsible use by adults. Um, and helping to make healthy choices, easy choices in our communities. Um, kids are really heavily impacted by what adults in the community are normalizing. So, um, so we talk about uh, strategies that both uh, support adults and support kids, um, and particularly adults who are in recovery too and are also trying to maintain a substance oh, I health. think you went mute, Mariah. Oh, can you hear me? Jeff, I can hear her. Oh, good. Can everyone else hear me? There could uh, be a problem. We, we seem to lot have lost her, Sam. It's something at the Miller Center. Yeah. Just give it a second, Mariah. Uh, sometimes we have technical problems at the Miller Center. Okay. Are, are you muted on your end, Mariah? Um, no, <laughs> I'm not. No. Oh. We can hear her on Zoom. Oh, it looks like we lost her. Oh. Okay, how's that? Can you hear me now? Oh. Uh. Okay, no. what was that? Can you hear me now? Okay, so uh, Mariah, I have a suggestion. So if you actually sort of log out and then we're gonna try logging you back in again. Sure. As a, okay? Yeah. Yeah, so try that, okay? So Sam will let you back in. And for everybody else, uh, while we're here, um, we're not going to play the the balloon commercial from the drive-in movie, but we <laughs> um, actually uh, Dave Dave Kirk has joined the meeting, and he did go attend the school board uh, meeting that the school commissioners or members were at, and didn't come here. So, Dave, I give you five minutes if you want to give us an update from that meeting. Sure, I don't mind. 
And then we got to uh, continue with our regularly scheduled programming. Perfect. Yes. So, so first, um, uh, the school board uh, staff does and is uh, actually trying to save us money. Apparently, um, that is their. That's what they're saying. Um, so, I did hear from um, the superintendent that they got a ten million dollar grant to put the um, the aviation project at the airport with beta technologies um, assistance. So $10 million of, of the cost of the high school will be moved up there. They estimate a $20 million savings, but um, in clarification from the superintendent, he was unclear how much more than $10, $10 million it would cost us to put that program up there. So there's a little gray area there about saving $20 million. It may not be initially at a $20 million savings at the end of the day. They're not really clear about how much it's gonna save. Um, so it's a little crazy right now uh, as time goes on. Uh, the other thing um, I was, uh, I was shocked to hear is that we don't have time to know exactly what this project is going to cost us. We need to vote on it in November. So by August 17th, the deadline, we have to have a bond ready to go to, to the taxpayers so that it can be on the November ballot, which I do understand. But if we don't have all the information, perhaps we should pump the brakes is exactly what I asked for them to do. Um, I do know Representative Ali Jang is 100% behind the um, spending of the money. And he was quoted on Channel 3 today of spending the money and doing whatever it takes to build the high school. His, the is about what channel three said in their write up on him today. So I would just be cautious about this. The school board is going to come to us with, um, I would assume will be over $150 million, which city council has said is the top line. Moreau, uh, the mayor has kind of wavered on that a little bit since he said it. Um, but commissioners have said $150 million is our bonding capacity in the city of Burlington. I don't know if that includes the 43 million that the school is in uh, debt to us already. Um, but this could bring us well over $200 million in debt just for the school district, not counting the hundred million dollars a year. That's kind of the update. That's your bridged edition that I gathered from it. I'm not speaking as a school board member. I'm speaking as a taxpayer, just trying to, you know, keep everybody on the same track. Um, I don't think the school board has been doing a really great job of getting the message out. Um, I do have three documents I pulled off of the agenda tonight that explain some of this. It was on the agenda at board docs. So feel free to look there. Cool, Jeff. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Uh, Mariah, you want to give this another try, please? Sure. Can you hear me now? No. Oh, maybe. Can you hear me? No. Uh, on, no. Zoom, on Zoom, we can. Jeff, can you hear yeah, me? We're not hearing you. No. It's, it's, yes, it's I can hear you, Evan. But no, uh, sorry. sorry. So they no. cannot hear us in the Miller Center. Oh. It says Sam needs to or jordan or whoever's there they're having an audio problem between zoom and the miller center evan okay i can hear you oh you hear hear me okay jeff clark yeah can you hear me yes okay can you hear me yes all right can hear you. All right. okay <laughs> jordan <laughs> heard his name i guess great okay, <laughs> okay. i'm gonna Thank try you, sharing Mark. my screen again Yes, okay. go ahead, please. Good. Thank you. Okay, yep. here we go. All right, so just, um, I don't know, wave to me or if holler if you can't hear me. Um, but I'm just going to dig right into the tool that I mentioned that we have for you all. So, um, so in the fall uh, and winter of 2018, we completed an assessment of all the alcohol and tobacco retailers in Burlington. Um, we had staff and youth um, and adult volunteers who helped as well as the health department. Um, and um, 
assessments like these were done across the state. So we have some comparable data to other areas of the state. We went to each of the stores in Burlington. We tracked things like product placement, um, advertising, location of advertising, things like, is it under three feet? Um, or is it on the outside of the building? Does it light up? And then we compiled all that data um, from those audits and we used it to create maps and we put it into an online tool so that people could look at geographically the impact of retail outlets within the area. We looked at density of retailers um, and the impact on the surrounding populations, such as is there a lot of stores near a school or a youth center? Um, and then we put all that, in, like I said, into an online interactive tool. Um, and then we overlaid it with things like the census data showing poverty rates, um, location of schools and neighborhoods, um, so that you could start to have discussions in your neighborhood about some of these things and think about um, how you might want to create changes or designs for the community um, or think about that impact. Um, we are currently in the middle of another assessment right now, hopefully uh, happening this summer with the Department of Liquor and Lottery. Uh, they'll be collecting new audits of all the uh, tobacco and alcohol retailers in our state. Um, and so that will be updated on the site later this summer, but we wanted to, we have the site ready. We want to share it with folks um, and then we'll just try to keep it updated as often as we can with new data when it makes sense. Hopefully again, doing another one next year when cannabis outlets are uh, begin sales in October of this year. Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'll pull, I'll pull up the tool, but um, it is a little bit trickier to kind of look at when on, so I encourage folks to look at it on your own. I'll pull out some of the data and information that I brought from that. Um, so that you can think about it and how it might be useful for your own community. Um, so uh, I do wanna note uh, to set the stage that all of the images that you'll see in both my presentation and on the website that I mentioned are from our community. We uh, Most are taken from uh, youth that uh, took pictures of things that they saw as problematic in the community. Um, um, so they're all uh, Burlington photos. Um, and uh, we'll talk about the, again, the community level prevention. So we're just talking about things that are the root causes of youth substance misuse at a community level. Things like community normalization of substance use, access to and promotion of substances in a community, low perception of harm. Um, if people feel that there's a, uh, that harm is, uh, there's not a lot of harm from a substance, they tend to use higher rates. Um, and early onset of use or use, uh, youth using early. Um, and I, I threw this in here too, just so you uh, kind of know why these are some of the things that we talk about. One of the things we know is that, um, that youth are much more influenced by advertising than adults are. Uh, the data, um, there's different data, but uh, folks say at least twice as likely to be influenced by advertising, if not four times as likely to be influenced by advertising. Um, and we're seeing the same thing with cannabis or marijuana ads as that we see with alcohol and tobacco um, advertising, that regular exposure to advertising um, seems to increase youth rates or uh, increase uh, favorable attitudes about using. Um, so in Burlington, uh, one of the, well, one of the things we know that strategic placement of advertising um, at children's eye level also normalizes use um, of the substance in everyday life for youth um, and uh, is a risk factor for um, increased access and per, uh, a low perception of harm. So um, on the screen, you'll see that of those of that those audits that we did in our community, 57% um, of alcohol retailers had alcohol ads on the outside of the doors and windows that were visible from the store, which I think will be really um, is useful information when you're thinking about the number of retailers that are close to our schools, which um, you'll see in the, in, the, in the online website tool that we have. Um, and the statewide average for that is 32% when we compared to other store audits. We also found that um, more advertising in Burlington um, had in, more inside advertising as well. Um, so now let me just show you real quickly the tool because I wanted to point out um, a few things that might be relevant, particularly for this board. Um, so hopefully it'll just let me link right to it. Here we go. So this is the website. 
Um, and I'm gonna, you know, as I said, take some time on your own. I've, I'll, at the end of the presentation and within this presentation, there's links to it. You can also find it on our website. It's um, linked within there. So I'm gonna scroll through a bunch of things that you can kind of read on your own time. But what I want, did wanna show you was the maps. Um, and so this one, uh, there's kind of three maps that we have so far. And if folks are really interested in particular information, it might be something we could glean or add. So please do let us know if there's things we should add. Um, but um, one of the things we wanted to look at for this area, so first you can see kind of density, where are there large groupings of um, uh, of retailers and one of the things you know for maybe for ward four and seven is that your rates have compare your wards have comparably good rates of retailer density and lower numbers of alcohol and tobacco retailers um, near schools than some other wards so this um, actually I'm gonna pull over here so you can see your wards better um, so this uh, map shows um, location and proximity to schools. So you can see the circles, the, the darker blue circles are 500 feet from a school and the where it gets lighter is a thousand feet from a school. So there's not a ton of retailers in there. And one of the reasons I kind of point this out for your community is thinking about the impending cannabis um, retail that's coming into the community. So there will be more licenses that are being issued right now and starting in October. Um, it's the time of year. It's the time for communities to start thinking about how policies can be preventative um, in terms of supporting uh, youth not to have a lot of promotion um, near places where they're spending a lot of time. So thinking about the Miller Center or the um, schools, places where they're going to be spending a lot of time. We don't, we uh, hopefully don't want a lot of advertising and promotion of substance use around them. Um, and the states that aren't doing this work or that didn't do this work, I should say, um, are really struggling right now to try to do, so, to fix some of these problems later. Um, so we have a rare opportunity to make healthy choices, easy choices before we start getting, before some of these policies get in place. So that's one of the things I thought uh, might be helpful for this board to have conversations about. And you can think more um, about what makes sense for you all. Um, I'm gonna pull you back to our slideshow. There we go. So, um, so just to, I pulled here again, the root causes of substance use, again, at a community level, and some strategies that um, research shows have been effective in preventing youth initiation and use. Things like creating buffers around schools and places that kids gather, like I mentioned, establishing density maxim maximum, so no more than so many retailers within a set area, uh, prohibiting use at places that are very family friendly, like parks, um, uh, prohibiting adult only advertising um, in locations where uh, where kids are spending a lot of time. So uh, one of the things that we see in some of the other areas of Burlington is there's a lot of alcohol and tobacco ads on the outside of the building in front of or near schools. Um, so thinking about um, how you can have conversations with retailers or whatever other strategies you wanna use to, um, to address some of those issues that, that have propped up with alcohol and tobacco. Um, so a quick summary, um, and again, I'll share this, uh, uh, the slideshow and folks can look at it. All this information is also on the website. But a quick summary, the earlier people start using, the more likely they are to develop problems um, and helping youth delay use for as long as possible, sorry, while their brains are still developing um, is an important preventative tool. And the substances the kids almost always start with are alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis that lead to other substance use. So there's not one gateway drug, drug, there's really three, or any substance use tends to lead to more substance use when you start while well, the brain is still developing. So social norms and easy access to and promotion of substances can all increase that underage use. And we can support kids by limiting exposure to those things and think about how advertising and use in public spaces um, is allowed. Um, and we have uh, some work that we're doing to help continue to have these conversations, to help think about how we build a healthy community. 
Um, and so if you're interested in getting involved, you can reach out to me. My contact information is on the slide. Um, and we've also helped to create some tools for communities to have these conversations. So I left those resources at the bottom and they're also linked on the website. And I'll stop there so that maybe we have a minute or two for questions. Yep, very, very well done. Thank you, Mariah. So let's see, any, any questions here in the Miller Center? Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, okay, Sylvia? Uh, my thoughts turn um, momentarily to uh, the Bessery Meat Market on North Avenue. I see a lot of kids congregate around that shop uh, after school. So I'm wondering, I'm hoping he doesn't become a, a neighborhood shop for cannabis um, and what we might do to approach him about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I see uh, one hand on online so far, Matt. Thanks, Jeff. Maria, I just had a question. You mentioned that statistically Burlington retailers are 57% for marketing in storefront windows versus 32% in the rest of the state. I just wonder what the relationship is to youth abuse for Burlington versus the rest of the state. Are we an equidistant 25% increase? Are we the same? Are we double? What is that statistic look like? Yeah, we are not. So it's, um, we are, well, I guess it depends on what, what substance you're looking at. It's a little, it's kind of all over in um, our data, depending on like what substance you're looking at, which populations you break it down to as well. Um, we are um, in, in a lot of our areas, um, we, uh, have actually less substance use than um, more rural areas of the state, some of the more uh, rural areas of the state. Um, but there are certain populations in our community that are showing higher substance use rates. For instance, um, uh, LGBTQ identifying youth show high substance use rates. Um, students who identify as um, or marking the box for mail um, in certain grades. So it's it's harder to say, but on average, if you're comparing the average of like alcohol use to the rest of the alcohol use for the state, we aren't, we're fairly comparable. So even though there's a much higher advertising rate, the actual outcome of abuse doesn't really change all that much. I'm just curious, I like stats. Yeah, no, it's an important point that you're making. Thank you, Matt. I mean, they're um, ugly. I don't like them, but yeah. having a real impact, I guess, would be my question. Yeah, um, it's tricky when it comes to like those kinds of conversations to make. You can't make a correlation, right? Um, between that type of data. It's really, there's a lot of different things that play, um, that have a play in why substance use rates are the way they are. Um, so I can't say that, you know, that is one of the things that we know from the research is that promotion of substance use in a community impacts substance use rates and tends to lead people high, to higher rates. Whether that's correlated to um, like looking at our specific substance use rates, I don't know if I'm answering that or if I'm like explaining that well, but I don't know that we can make a direct correlation. So we're trying to look at the strategies that science says will help us reduce our substance use in our community and implement those strategies. Uh, so thank you, Mariah. So if you could actually make that slide deck available uh, to us, then the steering committee will post that on our neighborhood uh, forum. Perfect. Uh, so I think all of that information would be really helpful so that folks could have a chance to ponder it at their own speed yeah that sounds great should i send it to you jack or um yeah you can send it to any any of us on the steering committee or uh evan can help us with that certainly great yeah 
Yeah. Sounds good. Thank he's you. Our, he's our inside trader here. So. Yeah. Thank you so <laughs> much for having me in that city. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Well, <clears throat> we're ma maintaining our schedule, so we're going to uh, move on to the next uh, subject. So I will invite Chief Murad uh, and Alex. You want to join the chief up here, please? Thank you. So our next segment is uh, Chief Murad and Alec Keating. Is Keating. That Keating? Yeah. Um, he's with the Parks and Rec Department, but he's um, leading the, the new Park Ranger program as part of the overall um, public safety strategy. So I'm going to... Uh, so. Gentlemen, I think what we're going to try to do is uh, Chief will start with 10 minutes. Sure. And then, Alec, if you want 10 minutes, and then we have, uh, you know, another 10 minutes for uh, conversation and dialogue after that. And I have a feeling this is one of those topics where folks aren't going to mind extra innings. So here we Great. go. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks. much. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, and I, I've brought some some paperwork that is available to everyone uh, online. So one thing that, that I've tried to do over the past two years is make what we're doing at the BPD as transparent as possible. I haven't been as successful as I'd like. I would love to be able to invite everybody into the police department to let them understand what the men and women inside the department do, who they are as, as human beings. Uh, and and, and the motivations that we have for the work that we do, uh, it's, it's not t entirely feasible, but what I have done is increase uh, by, I think, almost 100% the number of directives that we keep up online. So it's all available on our website at the city website. I put, uh, when I meet with the police commission, the independent citizen police commission every month, I, I put together an entire presentation for them and I post all of those presentations on our website. Uh, it's got recurring amounts of data. When I have had to to make drastic changes to the police department over the past two years owing to staffing issues. I have put those uh, presentations around those changes up as well. Last May, in May of 2021, we implemented a priority response model. And this past May, we had to amend that priority response model. And the reason is that our staffing is down drastically. Uh, in June of 2020, we were authorized at 105 uh, author officers and we had 92 or 93, depends on whether I'm counting one who was already on terminal leave. Uh, we were then, uh, the, there were changes in funding and changes in headcount allotment uh, that brought that number down, an authorized number to 74 through attrition. Um, that number has since been increased in October of 2021 to 87. But in the meantime, we fell from that 90, low 90s and a historic hovering of around the high 90s to where we currently are which is at 63 actual officers, only 52 of whom are currently effective because a number are off on military deployments. Some have long-term injuries. I have three who are on what we call terminal leave. They've expressed their desire to leave and they're burning vacation time that they've accrued over the course of a long career. Those changes uh, have, have made us have to make certain kinds of alterations to the way we normally deploy. The biggest of which is the creation of something that we call the city center area. We've gone from being a police department that used to spread out across the entire city, putting officers in five geographic areas around the city, the new north end, the old north end, the hill section, the downtown area, and the south end, to being a department that really only focuses on the downtown core, something we call the city center area that runs essentially from Maple to uh, Riverside. So it is uh, the old north end and the downtown core and a little sliver of the western part of the hill section. And we are not uh, in the old North End, excuse me, in the new North End with the frequency with which we once were. We are not in the South End with, with any real frequency. As we have gotten smaller with regard to sworn officers, I've worked hard to build other kinds of resources because those were some of the things that our uh, that our neighbors asked for in June of 2020 when when we thought about how to re envision policing. And some of the things that we've built are uh, new positions that are social workers embedded inside the police department. They are called community support liaisons, and they have uh, most have master's degrees in social work or other commensurate kinds of education. 
They work on issues around houselessness, around substance use disorder, around mental health crisis. Uh, we also have a position that pre-existed uh, my tenure here. It was called a community service officer. That is an unsworn, unarmed member of our department, somebody who does not carry a firearm as I do. I'm, I'm a level three police officer certified in the state. I can arrest people. I can enforce the law. Uh, CSOs, community service officers, cannot. They can write certain kinds of municipal tickets because they are employees of the city, but they can't arrest people, they can't use force, and they are now responding to a number of quality of life calls, calls around noise complaints, calls around issues with people who may be intoxicated but not belligerent or otherwise uh, dangerous, uh, calls around, they, they do patrols on Church Street and in other parts of the city to project municipal presence. Um, I have gone from having only two of those to having eight uh, and I'm seeking to have 12 in the new budget that is going to be, that has been presented to the city council and will hopefully be approved at the end of this month. Um, I invented, as I said, the CSL or community support liaison position. We had none of those prior to June of 2020. We now have three plus a supervisor. I am hoping to have six plus a supervisor if the budget is approved as the mayor and I have put it forth. And I want to be clear, the mayor's support for these programs has been instrumental and constant. Uh, it was not, uh, you know, he, he didn't believe in the idea of, of having the department get smaller with regard to sworn resources, although he has been incredibly supportive of the need for other kinds of resources to be built. Um, now, uh, among those things that we've been building also are ways of using those different kinds of resources. We are, are deploying those CSOs, as I said, on Church Street in the marketplace, on foot patrols. We are using the CSLs to do follow-up work with people who have exhibited issues around, as I said, mental health, around substance use disorder. An example would be officers go to every single overdose in the city if it's reported to us. Uh, they obviously can happen without a report. Report. But a, a concerned person sees a friend overdose on opioids is the majority of the time. Uh, they call the police and fire. Police and fire arrive. It is oftentimes, it can be a dangerous situation. Sometimes people who have overdosed and are interrupted in that overdose through the administration of Narcan can become very belligerent. They don't like having their high reversed by the Narcan. Uh, fire will not show up for many of those calls if their preference is met without a police officer present. But we also have a CSL respond either with or immediately after the officers in order to try to connect with that person who has overdosed in order to say, is are there things that we can be doing to help you? Can we get you into treatment, et cetera? Um, so, uh, I would, I would urge everybody to take a look online at the very head of the Burlington Police Department page of the City of Burlington website. The very top, there's a, clicking, a clickable link to our priority response plan that spells out the way we prioritize the 130 different kinds of call category that we count through our Valcor, our Valcor system. Some of them are priority one. Those are things like robberies, like uh, assaults, like domestic incidents. Um, there are also things like 911 hangups. What makes an incident a priority one is the idea that we are always going to go to that. It is not something that we can safely say, we don't have the ability to go right now. Priority twos can go either direction, depending on whether they're in progress, depending on whether a caller articulates that there's a life safety component. Um, and those would include, for example, a burglary. A burglary happening is absolutely a priority one. If you're home and you believe somebody's in your house, that is a priority one call for us. If you are coming back from vacation and you report that you believe your house has been burgled and it's after the fact, that is not a priority one call for us. And the way we currently are resourced, you may not get an immediate response for that. That becomes a priority three and it may end up having a response that is delayed or what we call stacked so that a call comes in uh, to dispatch and the dispatcher says, I don't, we don't currently have enough resources available to respond to that immediately. I'm sorry. And then they look to have uh, additional resources follow up. I've changed a number of those priority threes to CSO only response. I've charged a, uh, changed a number of those priority threes to online only response. Um, and those are all delineated in, in that report that you can look 
look at. That report also talks about our overall incident volume. Overall incidents, which are not crimes, they are merely a record of police action, are down. They are down over the past several years, from the early 2010s uh, through 2019. About half of the decrease during that period actually came from a voluntary diminishment in traffic stops by police officers. We do fewer traffic stops. But there has been a diminishment in call volume overall. Our priority one call volume, however, those important calls that I say that we always go to, are higher this year than they have been in, in the past six years. And I generally track in five-year trends plus the current year. And so uh, I can go back all the way to 2016 and not find a higher year for priority ones than we currently are experiencing. Um, there are a number of different data trends that are in there as well uh, that you can find, including some discussion of, of the gunfire incidents that we've seen a very troubling increase in. Um, and I'm working, I'm actually having me a meeting tomorrow with the state's attorney and with the U.S. attorney attorney or a member of the U.S. Attorney's Office in order to discuss some approaches to uh, these gunfire incidents that we find so troubling. Um, uh, and I, that you can also see sort of the, uh, the pattern of when they occur or don't occur in that uh, report. Um, but you can also see the ways in which we're trying to grow and we're trying to get out of this hole that we have found ourselves in staffing wise. And that includes, as I said, seeking to build these other resources, such as the community service officer and the community support liaison. It also includes a very clear plan from the mayor for us to be able to get back to that authorized number of 87 uh, within a, in a reasonable time frame. I believe that we can do it. It is achievable but ambitious for us to do it by uh, within three years. But to do so, we're going to have to increase our rate of hire of new recruit officers by 50% over historic norms, and I'm not counting 2020 and 2021 where I couldn't hire anybody. Looking at 2010 through 2020, um, the average number of recruit officers we brought in was 4.1 per class. If I can increase that by 50% to six per class, if I can increase the number of lateral officers, those are officers who are already police officers in another state or another police department in this city, excuse me, in this in this state, but they come and they, they have a, slow, a, a shorter time period for them to become uh, officers on the road. If I can increase the number of lateral officers by 100%, from an average of 1.4 per year to three per year. And if I can improve our retention uh, uh, by, by 50%, then I can get up to, oh, sorry, thanks, time's up. Oh. Then we can actually get to a point where we would have that staffing back over three years. Those are lofty goals. They're gonna require a lot of effort and frankly, money. And that is a component of the budget that the mayor has presented. Um, and I apologize for going over. Thanks, Jeff. That's, you can coordinate with Alex. All good. All right, Alex. <laughs> uh, well, thank you all. Uh, my name's Alec Cading. I'm the Waterfront Operations, Waterfront and Parks Operations Manager. Sorry, I'm still getting used to that new title. Uh, fancy way of saying I manage North Beach, all the beaches and water access points, along with the urban rangers. Um, new program just started, literally. <laughs> we are just getting out. We have now, as of today, we have six members on the team, two full-time, four seasonals. Um, and we have a lot of parks that we try to cover. If you happen to be out in the parks and you happen to see this logo, a little bit easier, stop, say hello. Uh, they're very approachable. We want them to be that way, just like any park ranger. Um, I bring that from my experience in the Michigan State Parks. Uh, we want to be out there for everybody just to say hello. Um, if you have a question, stop and talk to the Rangers. Uh, our job in the parks is to be educational. Uh, we are out there to inform people, uh, not to say, hey, you can't do that. I'm sorry, the ordinance says, you know, you, you can't have dogs here, but we like to give options. Here's you know, there's a dog beach over here. A lot of people don't know that. There's a, uh, you know, we're perhaps trying a new program, opening different parts of different beaches to send dogs to, or, or uh, let people know, you know, for the safety of the dog, it'd be a good idea to have the dog on the leash. Just, just some examples that we see in the parks and and regularly hear from people with. Um, they will be out on bikes. They are out on bikes. Um, they're on the bike path daily, bright yellow helmets, <laughs> bright yellow bags. Um, uh, we do have, oh, 
lots and lots of parts with only the six to cover. So uh, you may not see them in every single park every single day. Uh, we want to get out to the parks where you don't get to see people too often. Maybe the guy that does the garbage in the morning and that's it, like, like Baird Park or something like that. We'll be the ones that are out there checking out, saying hello to people, checking the playgrounds, you know, just walking around, talking to folks. So um, we'll be very visible in the parks, very visible on the waterfront this year. It's a new program. We're starting from scratch. Uh, so we're, we're trying to work through all the kinks and you know, kiboshes that happen with it. And, and we're hoping to, uh, pull it all together to make a program that Burlington can be really proud of. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we'll... Okay. So we'll start with some questions here at the Miller center. Okay. I have some questions. First of all, thanks to both of you and to chief Murad, you have done the most incredible job with some of the most horrible people that you've had to deal with on the city level. And I apologize for that. And I have no problem calling them all the time and letting them know how I feel. You've just done an incredible job and working with so few people. It's really appreciated. Now I'm going to ask you a tough question. I, as a volunteer with the court system for the past 20 years, have some real issues with the Chittenden State's Attorney's Office. And I'm hoping that there's a big change there this year. Um, how do the police officers feel about the way the court, not the court system, but the um, Chittenden County Attorney's Office reacts or does not react to what you folks need? Thanks, and and thank you for uh, for those kind words. with With regard to the the uh, state's attorney, I, I have a, a good relationship with uh, state's attorney George. We meet for lunch uh, every every other month or so. Um, she's under some some challenges herself. The court is still in a state of emergency. The governor rescinded the state of emergency more than a year ago. The mayor rescinded the state of emergency with the city council's approval more than a year ago. The courts have extended it until August thirty first. There is currently there have I, I believe there's been one jury trial in Chittenden County uh, for a Chittenden County case in the past two years. Um, uh, there are, are real challenges there. That is also affected by a, a philosophical belief on the part of the state's attorney about what should and should not be prosecuted. What we have done at the police department in order to address that is that we preemptively refer an increasingly large number of cases to our community justice center, which is a part of the city through the uh, uh, through CEDO, um, the Community Economic Development Office. And the CJC, or Alternative Justice, allows for certain kinds of cases to be addressed uh, through a restorative process where, where people participate. It also prevents what had been the norm for a while of declinations. That is, uh, cases being presented to the state's attorney uh, and then being returned to officers with decline to prosecute owing to the pandemic, owing to uh, court, uh, the, the fact that the court is closed, owing to sometimes a sense that this might be more appropriate for alternative justice. And so we've basically sort of seen that writing on our wall and, and moved a lot of these cases towards alternative justice. Um, I think that, you know, uh, I'm hopeful that tomorrow, for example, I'll be able to have a very good meeting with the state's attorney. We did a press conference with the mayor and the state's attorney, I guess, two weeks ago now around the issue of gunfire incidents. Uh, she has indicated a, a desire to, to help us address this unique problem that we're experiencing. Uh, she has, to be clear, uh, every time we've presented a case to her for a gunfire incident, she has sought to hold that individual without bail, which is... The, the standard for uh, the highest standard for the law with regard to keeping someone. The, the prosecution after that fact can be affected by a lot of things, by the by whether or not witnesses are cooperative, by whether or not victims are cooperative, um, by the, the vagaries of the current court. Uh, all of those are things that we deal with. I only can encourage my officers not to worry about what happens after them, aside from knowing that you need to develop strong cases and that mere probable cause, which is our standard to present a case, is not our goal. Our goal is to present cases that are going to meet the burden of beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and, and I believe that we generally do so. What happens after we do our work is, uh, is not something that necessarily affects whether or not an officer is going to take action. And I 
don't want it to. An officer that encounters a situation in the field needs to take action based on that situation that he or she is encountering in that moment to keep people safe, to respond appropriately, to do what's best for the, the public that is called, the victim who is called, the perpetrator, uh, and for the officer, and not to worry about whether or not this is or is not going to be prosecuted. That shouldn't be part of the calculus that we address when we uh, tackle these problems. I'm curious if some of the staffing issues that y'all have could be addressed by technology. Is that the question? I just, I didn't want to, thanks. That's a terrific question. And I'm sure that Parks has give some, given some thought to this too. Um, so I'll try to go quick. Uh, but can some of our staffing issues be addressed by technology? Well, as I said, a, a certain number of our calls for service, we are now diverting to online reporting. That's always something that's been available to us. But frankly, the default has always been up until now, when a person calls, we send someone. Dispatch's default was you called, we're sending somebody. Um, we're now trying to divert more resources to online. So that's a method by which technology helps. We certainly are hopeful to be able to get some additional camera coverage in certain parts of uh, the downtown area in order to uh, both keep an eye on things and build good cases after the fact. Um, that's an, a way in which technology can be helpful. Uh, you know, I think that there are a lot of ways in which technology can help us upstream. Again, if I'm able to, to explain what we do more and, and get more community support and understanding of what we do, I believe that ultimately has an impact on how many people be, uh, you know commit crimes in the first place, how many uh, cooperative witnesses we have, cooperative victims we have. Um, it builds on the trust. And, and frankly, trust hasn't been as strong for police as it should have been over the past several years now. So I think that there are technological ways that that can happen, uh, social media, different kinds of information sharing. Um, but insofar as, as sort of the tools of the trade and, and, uh, and finding out, you know, ways to apply technology to, to crime solving, I would love it if I could have, you know, three, three people down in our basement in a pool who can tell the future and let us know when a crime is going to happen. And then here comes a red ball and we'll go take it out before it happens. But, um, but th those are the ways that we currently deal with it. Um, just quickly, uh, I want to start with Alex. I'm curious, so how does the, the, the Ranger program going to coordinate with the CSOs on your staff? Is, is there a link to those efforts? Yep. Uh, we've already been to their training. Um, I've worked with the CSOs before. They've been huge help to us this year with our staffing levels being so hard to find people. Uh, the CSOs are familiar with myself and my staff already. Um, but the Rangers have actually done uh, training with the CSOs and the CSLs. Uh, we meet on a weekly basis, uh, finding out, you know, issues within the park system uh, with Lacey. Uh, and uh, we have all their, we're on a, a text chain, I guess you want to call it. And uh, we keep up to date on everything now with issues within the parks. So we have a direct line to all of them and they have a direct line to all of us. So Lacey, uh, Lacey, who he mentioned is Lacey Smith. She is the community support supervisor and is in charge of that three person, I hope soon to be six person team. And they are instrumental in dealing with uh, with people who are houseless, including people who are, uh, you know, tenting in parks, etc. Um, the other part of our department that works really closely with parks is our beach and parkers. And so those are generally young folks, usually people in between semesters in college, so that's a summer job for college students. Uh, you'll see them in bright uh, yellow uh, polo shirts and they ride around on the marketplace, on the bike path, at the beaches as well. They're going to be clearly overlapping in with regard to their remit with the park rangers. Um, and they have a lot to do with that in the same way that they also liaise with the, the lifeguard to the beach and they go uh, to the beaches. It's, it's a pretty good summer job if you're looking for one. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> Just the employment ad, you forgot the yeah. <laughs> How will Burlington Police Department or will Burlington Police Department be affected by the new dispatch system? 
That's a terrific question. Thank you. So uh, for those of you who don't know, there is a effort at, at uh, hand to regionalize our dispatch. Currently, our dispatch sits in the Burlington Police Department, um, and we were understaffed with re- dispatchers just as we are with police officers. I'm, I'm, uh, I've got an authorization for 12. I currently only have seven. Um, they are really a terrific resource because they know this city, and there are people in there who have worked in that room for years and years. They often know the people as well as the, the, the that is the, the folks whom we encounter on a recurring basis. And like most of life, there's sort of an 80-20 rule. About 20% of the people cause about 80% of the issues for us, whether they are service users who are having problems in life that we want to help, or whether they are people who are, are committing crimes or acts of disorder. Um, it is a very small number of folks who create a, a lion's share of issues. And those names come back again and again and again, and dispatchers get to know them the same way often officers do. They get to know the streets so that they're not blindly sending somebody. When I was a New York City police officer for 12 years, uh, the dispatcher I would be speaking to in the Bronx would actually be at the Metro Tech Center in Brooklyn and would have no idea about the street that that per- that she or he was sending me to. Uh, the fact that ours connect is really important, but regionalization is an efficiency model whereby uh, all the regional areas uh, that is South Burlington and Colchester and Winooski and Burlington and probably Williston and uh, are going to pool resources into a single dispatch center that will dispatch for that entire area. And there are going to be real efficiencies realized, and there are going to be some real gains with that. However, there are also going to be losses. And some of those losses are the intimacy with which uh, these people know us and help us. Um, it's, it is happening. Uh, the chief, one of the things that I believe Fire Chief Locke went to South Burlington to help work on is to, he, he created or was a, a spearhead of the regionalization moment movement here while fire chief in Burlington, uh, it will sit in South Burlington. And I think that going there is a way for him to to actually continue to work on that project that's important to him. So it's something that is happening. The state too is divesting itself of uh, what we call PSAPs or public safety answering points. When you call 911, you don't call my dispatchers. You call, generally you get the Williston PSAP and a person there says, okay, what's the issue? And then they say, where are you coming from? Okay. And then they connect you to dispatch. Um, the state is getting out of the PSAP business. It doesn't want to cover them anymore. And as a result, this regionalization model is going to be happening in a lot of other places. And there's a lot of money at the state level to try to foster that. Thank you. Okay, I see a hand online with Trish. Yes, thank you. Um, Thank you, this is for Chief Murad. Just two quick questions. First of all, Chief Murad, thank you for embracing um, the SRO, the CSO model and the social workers, the CSL officers. I've attended a couple of recent police commission meetings and was very excited to hear about this positive outcome. Um, and I want to thank also Councillor Jang for insisting on more resources for mental health so officers don't have to do everything. This is a really positive outcome to the reform movement. But my question is one, what percentage of calls to the department are now being diverted to the CSOs and the CSLs. And the second question is if there's a problem in a public school, some kind of incident, which officer or, you know, goes to the school to deal with the the incident? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Those are two terrific questions. So, uh, I don't have data on the number or or percentage of calls that are being diverted to CSOs. As I said, you can see on that sheet the kinds of calls that are CSO only response. I believe they equate to probably around 10 to 12, maybe 15% of total call volume uh, that we are sending CSOs to. Um, CSLs, on the other hand, we don't divert calls to CSLs. CSLs generally are follow-up. And the analogy that I use is that in policing, we have patrol, and those are people who do a mixture of proactive work or answering the radio, that is calls for service from the public and 911. We have detectives who do follow-up work that is usually generated by patrol. Patrol takes the first report, says this case is a little too complex for us. It's going to require a time uh, devotion that I don't have uh, because I've got to go back to answering the radio. I'm going to refer it to detectives. And then we have an emergency response, which in some big departments is a dedicated group of people like in the New York City Police Department, they have emergency services. We have officers who are both on patrol and officers who are detectives who train to be part of our ERU or emergency response unit. 
the CSLs in this analogy are somewhat similar to detectives in that they take calls for service that have been originally responded to by police or CSOs or street outreach, which is a function of the Howard Center. And those calls get referred to the CSLs for longer term, more sophisticated follow up. Sophisticated isn't fair because it, it, it sort of, that sort of suggests that the, the groups that, that did the referring maybe don't have the skill sets. But it's more about the amount of time that they have to devote to really trying to connect people with services and, and address problems that caused that initial call for service or police encounter or CSO encounter or street outreach encounter in the first place. So, so that's the way in which we, we work with those. With regard to your question about the schools, um, we don't have SROs anymore. That was a function both of the resolution in June of 2020 and of a survey and task force that the school system put together and most importantly, our staffing. When I, I currently have 22 officers available for the entirety of our patrol Control response. Um, and that is wrapped around seven days and 24 hours a day. And that means that at any given time, there's only five to four, four to five people available. And overnight, it's much less. Um, so I don't have the room to have a dedicated school resource officer. Uh, but what we do have is we have people who were school resource officers. If an incident were to happen in the school and we had time to think about the response and my former SRO were on shift, I would probably send her or the, the sergeant or officer in charge would probably send her. If it is an immediate thing, uh, something terrible or something that requires an immediate response, it's whichever officer is closest is going and all of them are going. And I do want to say I, I have been really, really disheartened and and troubled and even sickened by what I've seen out of Uvalde and and the the current status of what happened there. I think there's still information that will be learned. I don't think we have nearly a complete story, but what I have seen so far has been extremely troubling to me and upsetting to me as a law enforcement officer and leader. That is not the response that we train for or that we would engage in. We are going into a situation like that. Whichever officer is closest is going in and engaging. There is no waiting in a situation like that. There is no deciding that this is something too scary for us to tackle while people are being hurt. It's absolutely antithetical to how we operate and anathema to the philosophy of the men and women inside the agency. And um, anyway, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So had uh, there was one other hand up there online, and <clears throat> we're going to try to squeeze it in. I know we're at nine o'clock, but uh, <clears throat> Evan, uh, you had your hand up, and I'm going to give you two minutes. Oh my! Not Sorry. for your question. I'll be really quick then. Um, it was it was sort of a dual question for the two of you. One was, you know, I guess I misunderstood the Park Rangers program. Um, because I thought that there was going to be more of an enforcement component. Um, one of the things we hear just a lot in the north side of the city is what's happening on the beaches and in the parks in the evenings and at night. And so I um, and I think people are looking for somebody to turn to to sort of be a response um, when when able, of course. Um, and and it's not lost on me, um, Chief Murad. You know what those what those uh, restrictions are. Um, and then the second, so maybe you could address that, what your plan is for the evening and how you think folks can utilize you or should they call the police or whatever. Um, and then the second part of my question is, and I think some folks have brought up the, you know, um, concerns folks have had about the repeated folks just being released over and over and over back into the community until things escalate to the point where it is a gunfire incident or it is a more serious incident. Um, and, and just a couple days ago, um, and I realize that's out of your control. So just a couple days ago, South Burlington, however, um, arrested a woman who had gone back to the Cricket Wireless store and tased the employee there and tacked her with a taser. And that was reported in the news. And after, after the police responded, they flash sighted her. So I wondered if you might, uh, I realize that South Burlington in a different jurisdiction, I just wondered if you might talk about, you know, how, how your officers use flash sighting as discretion and sort of if somebody engages in a violent incident, why would we want them, you know, released back into the community on their own recognizance? 
It's great. I'll, I'll go you, you well, first for the, the, well, the the Rangers uh, will be there at, uh, to cover the beaches as well as uh, all my other staff that's there. Um, we do have people that go over from North Beach to exact. We'll say Letty uh, to cover over there uh, whenever we can. Um, but the Rangers uh, will also be there as well. They're based out of Letty, so that they can be there later in the evening. Um, we recently were able to purchase, uh, uh, since the campground's doing so well, uh, we've been able to purchase a couple more vehicles, which gives us the opportunity to post uh, more staff at, if I can hire them, we gotta find them first, uh, at Letty as well. Um, so we're hoping to, to dual threat of, not so much dual threat, but you know, uh, we'll have regular staff there as well as Rangers into the evening. Uh, and if that way they'll have eyes on and if need be, call the uh, BPD for help or, or let them know what's going on. We've already been successful at getting a couple uh, very inebriated, very young kids uh, off the beach and able to get their parents to come pick them up. Uh, for example, uh, when it could have been bad because their friends kind of left them. So, uh, you know, the situations like that, the Rangers have already shown that they can be useful for something like that. So, so I, I realize Evan's question was fairly complicated with the South Burlington situation. Sure. So if you take a short stab at it, sure. Okay. I'll try. I know that's not my strong suit. I think everybody's seen that that is not my strong suit. I will try to do it short. Um, uh, okay. So, uh, so I cannot imagine having somebody be tased and issue a flash site. That is an aggravated assault. It's a felony assault. That shouldn't be a flash site. That should be at least uh, an attempt to hold. Now, the decision to hold is not the officer's decision. It is the decision of uh, a judge. The officer brings the person into custody, says, uh, this is the situation. This is what we were, would recommend. And the judge either approves or, or doesn't approve. Um, but the decision to flash site in the field is usually the decision of an officer. Uh, the difference between a site and an arrest, by the way, is, is a little complicated. Um, a, an arrest is what you think of. It's handcuffs go on and you go back to the station and you get fingerprinted and then you maybe go to jail or maybe you get released from the station house, depending on what that judge says when you consult the judge. A citation is more like a ticket, but it's a ticket to appear in court at a later date. And in Vermont, uh, there are a number of things for which you cannot arrest. You, it, it, We have something called rule three in Vermont. And if a misdemeanor demeanor is unwitnessed by the officer not by a person, but by the officer, then the officer cannot arrest for an unwitnessed misdemeanor, with the exception of certain misdemeanors around violence and other things. There's some tiny exceptions. But for the most part, officer, uh, a caller says, my car was vandalized and I caught the guy and here he is. Officer arrives and got the person. He vandalized the car, he broke into the windshield, et cetera. Officer can only issue a cite in that case, unless there's a case for a felony that the vet damage was of such nature that you could call it a felony. But for the most part, that is going to be a, here's a piece of paper, once I can uh, affirmatively ID you, and you will be on your way, because Vermont doesn't want to hold people in custody. We're really, we're really against that as a state, which is good. In New York, every single person I arrested would go to central booking overnight. And, and that has, there's some things that are good about that. There's some things that are not. Um, and so uh, Vermont is a very different thing in that way. In this situation in South Burlington, you know, I have a very close relationship with Chief Burke. I admire him a lot. He sat in my, when I was Deputy Chief Operations, I succeeded him. Um, but when he went to South Burlington, that's why I was able to come home to Vermont and take this job. So I, I, I really admire Chief Burke. Um, I don't, I, I don't understand the situation as you're describing it there, Evan. I, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me in its particulars. I can look into it and try to find a better answer for you. No, I think that's a great answer, and thank you for for letting me have time. You never should have let me ask a question. It's always going to be complicated, but I appreciate it. it. And it was sort of short. Well, my was, remark actually. wasn't my remark wasn't intended as a dig, Chief. It was more <laughs> of trying to respect the bounds of the what we invited you for. So, okay. So with with that, I think we're going to wrap it up for this evening. I really appreciate you being here, and uh, so that I know the community and the steering committee would love to have you back in the future. And we will try to uh, plan with you for that. 
ahead it's of time. It's great to be here in person again. I have I have missed these. Nice. We we really appreciate it. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And so I guess we're going to wrap it up, folks. Thank you for being here, especially for being in person. All right. Good night, folks. Thank, thank you. you.